Dark Cast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Dark Cast Network is where you will find 20 wonderful shows that'll blow your mind. We've got Fruit Loops, Jury Room, and Cause of Death. Murder Murder News and Crime Time Nerds will take your breath. And then they were gone. Book of Lies, A Little Wicked, Are Sure to Please. Reverie True Crime and Autumn's Oddities are the bee's knees. We've got ODFM, Beyond the Rainbow, and Brew Crime, while Curly Conspiracies and October Pod are a good time. A Little Wicked, California True Crime, and Thrice Cursed are top-notch shows with no need to rehearse. So be sure to subscribe to all dark cast shows like Freaky AF and Over the Fence. Loving all of our shows <laughs> just makes so much sense. Hey, Rainbow Warriors, this is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors, and welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. When you get a chance, please follow me on the socials. I'm on Facebook at Beyond the Rainbow, Twitter, TikTok, and Tumblr as Rainbow Crimes, Instagram as Rainbow Crimes 12, and YouTube as Rainbow Crimes Unicorn Justice. If you'd like to help this one woman researched, written, recorded, edited, and produced show, please take a look at my merch store under Rainbow Crimes at Tee Public. Another way to show your support is to buy me a cup of coffee. I love coffee. Buymeacoffee.com backslash rainbow crimes offers listeners a way to support the show without breaking the bank. Other great ways to support the shows you listen to is by leaving a five-star review. It helps the podcast algorithm gods and goddesses find the podcast. Gaining visibility for often overlooked victims of the LGBTQ plus community is my goal for Beyond the Rainbow. And finally, if you could please tell a friend, pass the word along. Let's get these stories heard. Thank you, my warriors. This episode's missing but not forgotten LGBTQ plus member will be presented to you by my friends Cody and Molly at Over the Fence Podcast. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. November 27th, 2021 was the last time friends and family had heard from 37-year-old Kevin, aka Bear, Henry. Bear is an indigenous Coast Salish person of the Penaluckit tribe. Bear is also a genderqueer two-spirit who has been advocating against Fairy Creek old growth logging in Vancouver, British Columbia. Bear isn't the first person to go missing from the protests in this area. Bear's friend Gerald, aka Smiley Kearney, went missing in October around the same area. Protesters have been demonstrating at the location for over a year now against old growth blogging in southern Vancouver Island, and over 1,100 people have been arrested by the RCMP. Bear drives a 1980 Dodge Royal Camper with British Columbian plates. They read NB206H. The van is beige and brown. Bear is six foot three, 300 pounds, and a large build. They have green eyes and short brown hair. Bear is known to wear skirts and leggings. Bear's friend Smiley is a 61-year-old white man with shoulder-length gray hair. Smiley stands at 5 foot 4 inches and is about 210 pounds. He was last seen on October 13th walking between two camps near the Ferry Creek watershed about 10 a.m., more precisely along the Granite Mainline Forest Service Road. A search with a police dog and a search with a drone has failed to turn up either protester. Anyone with information on Smiley's whereabouts is asked to contact Sook RCMP at 250-642-5241. And anyone with knowledge of Bear's whereabouts is asked to call Victoria Police at 250 995-7654, extension 1. Thank you, Cody and Molly. I was so excited to find Cody and Molly as I was listening to True Crime Podcasts. They do such a great job covering cases. I knew we had to have them on the Darkcast Network. 
Once again, it's called Over the Fence. Let's talk a little bit about gangs. I think it'd be nice if all gangs were more like the West Side Story gangs, the Sharks and the Jets, and if they danced their aggressions towards life and each other away. But I guess even with the Sharks and the Jets, a weapon came into play and ultimately someone died. You have to agree, though. Real-life gangs are much worse than the Sharks and the Jets ever dreamed of being. There's codes and rules to live by, including kill quotas. They have initiation tasks. And many have the rule, no homosexuality. One of those gangs is the Latin Kings. The Latin Kings originated in Chicago in the 1950s, and they're mostly comprised of Hispanic Latino men. Although they began strictly with Puerto Rican males who were mostly immigrants trying to overcome racial prejudice. The Latin Kings have a rule, number 21, no homosexuality. It doesn't mean that there haven't been gay Latin kings. Most just remain discreet or they pay the consequences. But a Latin king might go out of his way to kill or beat a gay person. And there's some history of treatment of gays by the Latin kings. In 2008, Latin king member Christian Almonte was gay. He ultimately killed his lover, Willie Escobar. Christian stabbed Willie 20 times. The motive? It was first thought that Willie was killed because he was going to go public with his and Christian's relationship. But the true motive was? Christian found out that he was one of many of Willie's lovers. So Christian flipped into a jealous rage and he killed Willie. He was sentenced to life in prison and honestly, I can't imagine how the other Latin kings might be denouncing him in the facility. In 2010, seven Latin kings were arrested for attacks on three gay men in New York. One of the men, he was a kid really, he was 17. He was trying to become a Latin king member, but he was turned on for suspicion of being gay. The seven Latin kings grabbed him off the street, threw him into a wall, smashed him in his head with a full beer can, and then they sodomized him with the wooden handle of a plunger. Two other men that the gang thought were gay, they were also beaten badly in separate incidents. The gang members told officials their leader told them they had to participate or they would suffer the same fate, whether they were gay or not. With that preface, I guess what I'm getting to is the Latin kings are pretty tough dudes. A 27-year-old man by the name of Joshua Vallum of Loosedale, Mississippi, he claimed to be a leader of a chapter of the Latin Kings. He held the office of secretary, and he was considered an enforcer. I raised my eyebrow to this because the Latin Kings are mostly in Illinois, New York, Florida, and Texas. I suppose it's possible there's a mini-chapter in Loosedale, Mississippi, which is maybe why he was in charge? Honestly, the dude seems to lack the intelligence to be a leader of anything. So, a leader of a world-renowned gang? I'm kind of hard-pressed to believe that, although there are a number of resources saying he was. Anyway, Josh met a 17-year-old girl named Mercedes Williamson. He met her on Facebook. Mercedes lived on the Gulf Coast of Alabama, and she had the same dream so many other young teenage girls have, especially those who live in small towns. She wanted to move and live in Southern California. Her dream job was to be a makeup artist and hairstylist to the stars. Mercedes was loved by many for her kindness, her genuine caring, her honesty, and her fun-loving spirit. One of her most annoying but also endearing traits was how stubborn she was. Mercedes said get something in her head and that was how it was going to be. Don't try to change her mind. She'd have none of it. Mercedes was tall and had a slender build. 
She was a pretty girl with gorgeous eyes. Mercedes was also trans. She was comfortable with who she was. She had transitioned when she was 14. She started to talk to Josh on Facebook after he friended her. And it didn't take long for Josh to drive from his home in Mississippi to her home in Alabama. It was about a two-hour drive. The two would meet up as often as they could. They became involved in a boyfriend-girlfriend type relationship, and they remained in this relationship for eight and a half months. During this time, they had a sexual relationship as well, and they professed their love for one another. Many times, Josh would even stay over at Mercedes' house with her family. That way, he didn't have to drive all the way back home to Mississippi. Some of Mercedes' friends were less than impressed with Josh. He was rude, and basically they thought he was just a dick. Josh even had taken Mercedes and introduced her to some of his Latin King friends. After which, a couple of the guys, they teased Josh about Mercedes' broad shoulders, and was he sure Mercedes wasn't a dude? It wasn't long after that incident that Josh and Mercedes broke up. They stayed away from each other for a couple of months. And then slowly, Josh would return to see Mercedes. They'd have sex and he would leave. In May of 2015, one of Josh's Latin King friends had learned that Mercedes was a trans girl. He told Josh the news. And then he told Josh that he'd better take care of the Mercedes problem, or he'd better run because once the other Latin kings got a hold of the news, they were going to kill Josh. Josh told his friend he'd handle it. On May 30th, 2015, Josh drove near where Mercedes lived. She was walking down the road and he pulled over. He asked her to hop in and she did. He drove the both of them two hours away to his dad's property in Loosedale, Mississippi. He parked his car in a remote area of the property. He grabbed a stun gun and he held it into Mercedes' neck. He then took out a pocket knife and he started to stab Mercedes. Mercedes was able to open the passenger side door and she stumbled out of the car. She did her best to try to run and to escape Josh. Josh opened the driver's side door of his car. He grabbed a hammer from under the seat, and he took off running after Mercedes. He caught up with her, and then he bashed her in her face over and over again. He dropped to his knees, and he gathered some nearby brush to cover Mercedes' body with. Then he stood up, went back to his car, and drove the rest of the property to where his house was. Josh walked inside covered in blood. He saw his brother and he told his brother to keep his mouth shut. He then went to his room and then to the bathroom to shower. The following day, Josh's dad called the police. He told them he thought that his son might have killed someone. And further still, he thought the body of the person that his son killed might be somewhere on his property. Police came out to the property and they searched. It took a couple of days, but they found Mercedes' body underneath a light coating of dirt and sticks. Her face was beyond human recognition. A positive ID wasn't made until she was examined by the coroner's office. Josh's dad took him to the police station, and Josh turned himself in. Of course, in the interrogation room, Josh's version of what happened went down a little differently than the one I just shared with you. He said he and Mercedes knew each other only a couple of months, and he wanted to have sex with her, but Mercedes wanted to wait for the sex. And Josh thought, well, maybe she's just a virgin, and that's why. He said the day he went to pick her up, he decided... He wanted to take things to the next level. He wanted sex, and he let her know it, and she seemed okay with it. When they got to his dad's property, they were in the car making out, and he reached between Mercedes' legs, and he felt a penis. 
He said he then yelled, What the hell is this? And that he stabbed her. And he bashed her with a hammer. Because we all have a knife and a hammer readily available in our vehicles when we're making out with our significant other. And the other point I'd like to make here, they were together eight and a half months, not the two months that he claimed. He's supposed to be some hot shot gang member, and he's 27 years old, 28 years old. Does anyone truly believe he would have not tried something sooner during their eight and a half months? Which is probably why in his version of the story, they've only known each other two months. What it comes down to, warriors, Josh is full of shit. He told his gang member friends the story that he told the police, his version of events. And by the way, good on Josh's dad for doing what he did. Josh's mother is a completely different story, and I'll tell you more about her a little later. You know what Josh is trying to do with his version. He's building his trans panic defense for court. He'd been dating this girl. They were making out in a car, and he tried to cop a fill between her legs, and he felt a dick. This enraged him. He'd been tricked. So he stunned her with a stun gun, and then stabbed her with a pocket knife, and then bashed her to death with a hammer. It was her fault he snapped. I'm pretty sure the Loosedale, Mississippi police had never had a case like this before. They brought in the FBI. And now the case becomes a federal one, not just a city or state sanctioned case. The FBI interview friends of Mercedes. Her friends say it's bullshit. Josh knew Mercedes' dead name was Michael and that Mercedes was a trans girl. Mercedes' friends said that every time Josh picked Michael up, they'd go off and have sex. I'd like to point out that Josh came in contact and knew Mercedes' friends. Her friends called her Michael. I'm sure they didn't change what they normally call their friend in front of Josh. Josh knew Mercedes' dead name. He knew who she was. Soon, the FBI started to bring Josh's gang buddies into question. One of the members even had his home searched, where a binder with Latin King's bylaws were found. And like I mentioned earlier, rule number 21, no member should be involved in homosexual activities. Josh's relationship with Mercedes didn't fall under that. Mercedes wasn't gay, nor was Mercedes a man. These ignoramuses didn't seem to know a trans woman is a woman. It doesn't fucking matter what body intrusion might be hanging off of her. It's not her fault if she was born in the wrong body. She knows who she is, and no one else should ever be able to deny her that. This is a continual battle for our trans friends. They undertake this shit every day. And that is why living their truths is so dangerous. With the FBI searching their homes and questioning them, the Latin Kings were not happy with the heat they were under for Josh's crime. They wanted the Fed's eyes off of them. So they put some pressure on Josh, and he quickly confessed to the murder. But he was still using the trans panic excuse. A quick wipe of Josh's phone by the feds would result in hundreds of gay pornographic photos, mail-on-mail and dick pics. Now that would fall under the Latin King's rule number 21. That's what Josh should have feared. At trial, he was handed a life sentence, which we know warriors is never long enough. But since this was now a federal case... Even though it was being tried in Mississippi where there's not many protection laws for LGBTQ plus people, the 2009 Matthew Shepard James Byrd hate crime law was able to be acted upon since Josh was using the trans panic defense. The murder of Mercedes was obviously a hate crime. Josh pretty well screwed himself using that defense tactic. 
he had another 49 years tacked on to his life sentence. And those 49 years are solid. This case was the very first federal hate crime case against a trans woman. Josh now sits in his little prison cell, saying shit like, I'm pretty secure with my relationship with God. I don't think Mercedes is. I have to live with the fact I killed her and she's in hell. I'm pretty sure he gets that kind of crap from his mother. She's a gem too because the apple don't fall far. She said she considered the murder and Mercedes' sexual orientation a sin. Um, Mercedes was straight. She was a trans woman and she liked men. The mom went on to say that Josh isn't gay. Ask all the girls he dated. Look at the hundreds of pictures on your son's phone. The apple falls dumb out of that family tree. We'll make the dad an exception in this case. It seems there was some unicorn justice for Mercedes. I know it's never enough when we've lost someone, especially a young person. Rest in power, Mercedes. Our true crime quickie this episode comes to us from the Washington, D.C. area. Have any of you ever been to D.C.'s Black Pride Festival? It sounds lit. I looked up the D.C. Black Pride Festival in 2017 because it's at the time of the true crime quickie case I'm presenting to you this episode. It looks like there was a whole week of festivities for this event. At first, I wondered if I was reading it wrong. Are the events just for black people and black pride? But it really looks like it is for black LGBTQ pride. And as most LGBTQ pride events go, I think everyone's welcome, as long as they are LGBTQ friendly. The event started off light with an award ceremony on Tuesday, May 23rd, and the event continued on throughout Memorial Day when it closed out on Monday, May 29, 2017. There were all kinds of things happening. There were concerts and dances and, oh, I don't know, you name it, and it was probably there. The young man in our true crime quickie was 26-year-old Matthew Mickens Murray. He went by Matt, and he worked as a security guard in Washington, D.C., his friend said Matt was kind-hearted and he was a no-nonsense kind of guy. He had just spent his week enjoying multiple events at the D.C. Black Pride Festival. The last time friends remember seeing Matt was out at a gay bar in D.C. called Nellie's, and that was Sunday, May 28th. By Tuesday, the 30th of May, no one had seen Matt since Sunday night. Out of worry, friends and family called Maryland's Prince George Police because Matt lived in Maryland. I've never been back east. I didn't realize the states were so darn close. That's kind of cool. Anyway, his friends and family asked the police to do a wellness check on Matt. Tuesday afternoon, police went to check on him. When they arrived at his apartment at the 5400 block of Newton Street in Hyattsville, Maryland, no one came to the door. Family of Matt's gave police permission to force their way into his apartment should no one answer. When the police entered, they found Matt's body. It was lying in the living room. He had been stabbed to death. Matt had 36 stab wounds and 15 slash marks over his body. Whoever had killed him was very angry. Immediately, the police closed down the crime scene. Investigators were able to collect a lot of DNA on and around Matt's body. Much of the DNA was Matt's, but some of it was unidentifiable for investigators. The DNA matched no one in their crime database, so they marked it and they held on to it. Months later, family and friends of Matt's would question the Prince George police exactly what was being done to find Matt's killer. Police assured them that they had a lot of evidence on the case, just no real suspect yet. Years would pass. 
and still no justice for Matt. As time continued to tick by and Matt's case started to get cold in spite of all the evidence collected, forensic genetic genealogy started to be introduced to law enforcement agencies. We know this is how law enforcement was able to finally catch the Golden State Killer. With the awesomeness of regular people trying to track down the roots of their family trees, people might enlist the help of a service, something like 23andMe, which is an ancestral DNA home kit. From what I understand, you can order this kit, spit in a tube, send it back, and when your spit is processed, many things can be told about your family history and relatives. That's just kind of a loose explanation for me. I've not done it yet, but I've been thinking about it. The right person was trying to learn about their family tree, and they sent in a home DNA kit. Using forensic genetic genealogy, Prince George police ran a profile of the DNA they collected from the crime scene. A suspect popped up for them in July of 2020. It was three years after Matt's murder. Science is the shit, y'all. It's totally badass. The suspect who matched the DNA was 23-year-old Brandon Biagas. Brandon lived 45 minutes from Matt's apartment in Waldorf, Maryland. Prince George police picked up Brandon and they brought him to their station for questioning. Before they brought Brandon in, they did some digging. On social media, they found a connection between him and Matt. The two men apparently had been talking in a romantic way, and they had plans to meet up. Brandon's story, or should I say stories, at the police station, they continued to change. But the police were able to locate hospital documents, and it's from the night that they believe Matt was killed. The documents had Brandon's name on them. Brandon went to the hospital. He had cut marks all over his hands. He claimed he was attacked by a guy with a knife. The hospital treated his wounds and then they released him. A search of Brandon's car would actually turn up the knife that he killed Matt with and a pair of blood-stained shoes. When these items were tested, the blood on the knife and Brandon's shoes matched Matt's and Brandon's blood. Brandon finally pleaded guilty. He never offered a motive, though. To me, I feel the motive is probably one that is clearly overused. I think Brandon was a man who was scared about his own gayness. He took his self-hatred out on someone he was attracted to. Brandon ended up taking a deal of second-degree murder, and he was found guilty. He was sentenced to 30 years with probation possible after 17 years served, which means Brandon would be right around 40 years old when he's released. He took Matt's life. Matt, who was only 26 and had many more promising years ahead of him, Brandon can be released at the age of 40. That's still plenty of life for him to walk around and enjoy. In my mind, Matt is only getting partial unicorn justice. Rest in power, Matt. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs>